and I'm the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, an organization based in New York, which defends journalists and press freedom uh, around the world. Uh, we're an organization that uh, has been doing this for more than 40 years. And today is a very special day because it is World Press Freedom Day, a day when we mark the work of journalists, but not just journalists, also media workers and those who support press freedom, such as uh, lawyers and human rights defenders. Today, we have a, a panel discussion with uh, eminent panelists uh, who are going to talk about the war in Ukraine and the fallout from that. We're joined uh, by uh, a Ukrainian uh, journalist, uh, Sergei Tomilenko, who is president of the uh, National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. And he has been working to uh, combat acts of uh, physical aggression and impunity and efforts to undermine media laws and protect press freedom in Ukraine as the war rages. We're also joined from Vienna by Teresa Ribeiro, who is the uh, fifth representative on freedom of the media at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, she has a, a vast political and diplomatic uh, career covering human rights and media ex experience. I'm also joined from New York by uh, my colleague, Gulnoza Saeed, who is uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, Program Head for Europe and Central Asia. Gulnoza has more than 15 years of experience in journalism and communications, having worked in Prague and Bratislava, Tashkent, and now in New York. We're also uh, pleased to welcome Anya Neistat, who is the Legal Director of the Docket Initiative at the Clooney Foundation for Justice. She's joining us from Turkey. Anya has been involved in international human rights work for more than two decades and has conducted over 60 investigations in conflict areas around the world. Like, welcome to all of you, and I'm looking forward to what I uh, hope will be a very rich discussion. Uh, let me say that uh, for our audience members, after we have heard and had a, uh, from our panelists, there is uh, the possibility for a Q&A. And if you have questions, uh, please, you can put them in the Q&A function in the uh, bottom of the Zoom chat uh, on your screens. And um, towards the end of the conversation, we will come and I will take some of those questions and put them to the panelists uh, on your behalf. Today, the framing for uh, this conversation is, of course, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the, the war that is raging uh, at the heart of Europe and what that, is, what that means for uh, the media, particularly for Ukrainian journalists who are in the middle of this. The war has come to them, uh, to their homes. Uh, joining them have been many thousands of uh, foreign correspondents who are working there to try to bring us the news from the, uh, the front lines. And we have also seen a crackdown on the press in Russia where uh, punitive uh, sanctions have been imposed forcing uh, many uh, independent news outlets to close down and many hundreds of independent journalists to flee Russia for the safety of neighboring countries. We will get to all these and other topics uh, in the course of the next hour. We will also take a look at um, the use of uh, propaganda, uh, the lies that have been being pumped out, how journalists are combating those, as well as how journalists are dealing with the physical uh, threats to their safety. So we'll be looking at kinetic warfare, if you like, on the ground, the aggression from the Russian army, and also cyber warfare and propaganda. And I'd like to start off by going straight to Ukraine and straight to uh, one of the journalists on the front line. Sergei, what are some of the challenges facing you and your colleagues in being able to do your work as journalists at the moment? Could you just walk us through some of the, um, the, uh, the difficulties that you're facing in order to do your jobs. Hi, dear Rob and uh, dear friends. Um, no, as you know, Ukrainian journalists are very brave people and um, this has uh, been known for a long time, but the war has confirmed it once again. And um, for uh, Russians, uh, journalists are an obvious target. 
and we try to to protect our colleague as uh, from Ukrainian media, as from national media, and uh, as we see in, in the temporary occupied territories, after tanks and bayonets, a uh, campaign of pressure of journalists and clearing of information space is immediately launched. We see that uh, Russia. Uh, Russia target every independent journalist on territory which uh, Russia want to control. So we see this uh, this uh, maybe news desert which uh, Russia organized at every region, at every city which now uh, Russian controls in occupied territories too. And uh, we try to, to, to support, to help our colleagues and uh, but but uh, but uh, i see that uh, maybe ukrainian journalists are um, both as true patriots of ukraine but they are patriots of our profession and we try to combat russian propaganda and uh, we are very responsible uh, how to fight this propaganda and how to inform our uh, auditorium people about truth, about uh, real news, uh, uh, but but it's uh, it's 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 problem because uh, because journalists and media are unprotected on this war. We our uh, yep we now receiving some helmets, some vests, uh, some first aid kits. But uh, but if uh, Russia wants to Russian soldiers occupied, they want to kill. They killed uh, journalists and media workers. And for, on this day, uh, our union, National Union of Journalists of Ukraine, we see that uh, World Press Freedom Day is as may, may be a memorable day. But they for uh, we, because we issued uh, our list of media workers who are victims of uh, Russian war, and it consisted of uh, twenty three names of media workers as uh, as international journalists, as national journalists, as civilians, as soldiers, but uh, twenty three. Uh, this uh, as all victims of Russian war now. Thank you. Let me ask you, 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 you mentioned how you have to uh, combat um, the narrative being pushed by Russia. How, uh, how is it for you to get access to accurate information from the Ukrainian side? And are you being uh, targeted by what I would call uh, a Ukrainian narrative, which is which is uh, coloring the uh, the story in a particular way. Mm. No, um, uh, uh, no, uh, when we uh, talk about um, about Ukrainian journalists, uh, I see that. Uh, uh, Ukrainian government and our uh, military officials, they issued special rules and they try to limit, but, uh, but we see that the Ukrainian government try to explain all limitation, all the rules, and uh, the uh, only goal to limit some information is, uh, is uh, how to, uh, how to how not to uh, present some news, some information for Russians for next uh, for next stage of this war. So we see that uh, that in Ukraine, Ukrainian journalists or foreign journalists, uh, uh, they are not targeted by Ukrainian governments or some officials in Ukraine. But we see that uh, that Ukrainian journalists, as foreign journalists, as every independent journalist. Uh, uh, they are target uh, targets for Russians and uh, uh, as for Russian propaganda, as for Russian soldiers, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we see that Russia try to use every information, try to use every um, every news or maybe our profession 
as uh, informational terrorism. They try mm -hmm. to manipulate uh, auditorium and they try to, to create some picture of this war uh, in Russian colors. But uh, I think that uh, when we compare content of Ukrainian media with the content of Western media, we see the same picture. And for this moment, uh, as, as I know, there are about uh, 7,000 war press cards issued by media officials in Ukraine on this war, and half of them uh, issued for foreign journalists who now try to cover this war. So I think the picture of, of uh, an injustice, uh, mm -hmm. Russian occupation is the same in Ukrainian and Western media too. Right, before we, before we move on, just one more question. I, you mentioned at the beginning about uh, personal protective equipment, like just a very practical question. At the beginning of this war, we at the Committee to Protect Journalists were receiving requests from Ukrainian journalists for uh, safety equipment, safety training. Have you now, uh, your members, do they have that equipment or is there still a shortage of the basic uh, equipment and training skills that you need to be able to go and do your job? Mm, no, yep, uh, many thanks for some training activity for as about uh, first aid, about physical safety, and uh, yep, we're receiving some safety um, equipment now in Ukraine, but uh, for this moment, our union, uh, uh, biggest journalist organization, we received only maybe 100 uh, vests uh, from different donors. We are waiting for 100 more from UNESCO and the International Federation, but we, <coughs> we try to, uh, we try and we, for, for this moment, I uh, discussed with the reporters without borders and uh, we see that uh, Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainian media workers, we want to receive 700 vests and helmets for this war because every journalist now is uh, unprotected because, uh, because uh, when we compare with situation, uh, with conflict or war in 2014, there were only two regions with active war or two regions as war zones in Ukraine. But now uh, all 24 regions are unprotected. And as, as we see, uh, as Odessa, as Nikolaev, as Kharkiv, as Kyiv, uh, Russia tried to bomb every region. So we try to, to protect our journals and video mm -hmm. workers. But, but we try to assist. We try to assist some landing spot for foreign journalists, for Ukrainian journalists, and we are receiving such safety equipment, but, but uh, there is a big lack of it. Yeah. Thank you, Sergei. Before we, uh, we, we'll come back to you in a moment, I wanted to move on to uh, Golnoza and ask you, Golnoza, could you give us um, a, a, an overview of some of the press freedom violations that you have been documenting over the last two months in, in Ukraine and, and even in Russia? Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, and uh, just like uh, Sergei already mentioned, there have been uh, killings of journalists. We at CPJ uh, researched the killings of many journalists and were able to confirm that at least seven of them were killed while on assignment from uh, their respective newsrooms. Uh, it means that we talked to their colleagues, family members, or uh, Ukrainian journalist organizations like Sergei's and were able to confirm that those journalists were engaged in news gathering uh, at the time of death. Uh, and there have been uh, other killings of journalists. In some of those cases, we were not able to confirm whether those journalists were working uh, as journalists at the time of death. Uh, for example, a few days ago, a journalist from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Vera Hirich was killed when her building was bombed and we are still researching the circumstances. And uh, also uh, there were many deaths of journalists who volunteered to fight against Russian forces when the war started. Uh, we don't include them in our database because they died as soldiers, but 
I thought I should explain our approach and methodology because uh, Sergei mentioned 23 deaths of uh, journalists and media workers uh, since the war started. So uh, hence the discrepancy. And uh, many uh, journalists have been uh, wounded, some of them severely. So the risk of being killed or injured uh, is the biggest risk in this war, uh, just like in any war, I would say. And uh, if you look at the journalists killed in Ukraine, they come from different countries. There are Ukrainians among them, there are foreigners. There is a journalist from independent uh, Russian media outlet, The Insider, among them. So journalists have been a target uh, without discrimination. In general, we have seen that journalists can easily become victims of shelling or bombing because uh, Russian troops have not uh, refrained from uh, targeting civilian infrastructure or residential areas. They also targeted the media infrastructure, uh, such as uh, television towers in different parts of Ukraine. Uh, so one Ukrainian journalist, Evgeny Sakun, was killed in the bombing of the Kiev uh, TV tower. And we at CPJ have called on all parties uh, to recognize that journalists are civilians and uh, must be protected under international humanitarian law. Um, and uh, if many foreign uh, correspondents have a previous experience uh, reporting from conflict zones, local journalists, especially those who help foreign correspondents as uh, fixers, uh, they lack the war experience and sometimes uh, did not even have uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, as we call it. So uh, from the start of the war, uh, as you mentioned and Sergei talked about it, uh, we have been receiving requests for uh, PPEs. Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges for many journalists in this war, especially Ukrainian journalists, has been a challenge of procuring uh, protective gear. Um, and also in Ukraine, uh, journalists have been missing or taken hostage in some instances. Uh, while uh, they were at hands of the Russian forces, they were uh, forced to uh, produce propaganda in the territories occupied by Russians, or Russian soldiers tried to get uh, access to their websites or social media accounts. and. Uh, post uh, propaganda content. Uh, so in this war, the goal of Russia uh, clearly is not just to gain control of new territories of Ukraine, but also control information. The truth is targeted in this war. Uh, disinformation has been used very heavily. And uh, I wanted to point out that the information war between Russia and Ukraine uh, did not start on February 24th. Uh, it, actually, it has been going on for the past eight years since Russia occupied Crimea and uh, gained uh, control over eastern uh, regions of Ukraine. Uh, and there has been misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, and outright lies uh, about Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, in the Russian information space. And uh, I should also say that uh, in the past eight years, Ukrainians have become much better at debunking fakes and fighting Russian propaganda. I think even before the war started this time, they were better prepared. There were different media outlets that focused just on debunking news coming uh, from Russia or disseminating Russian uh, narrative. Um, some media outlets started, uh, you know, uh, producing content in English. And uh, these war uh, for the truth or over, you know, who controls the information has impacted independent Russian media as well. And since the war started, we have seen dozens, if not hundreds of journalists from independent media outlets fleeing Russia, because as you know, uh, the authorities have adopted new legislations on so-called fakes that practically bans the use of the word war or invasion and instructs all media outlets to describe 
the war as the special operation of the Kremlin aimed at liberating and denazifying, uh, quote unquote, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and many uh, journalists fleeing uh, Russia these days, uh, or those who are now in other countries, uh, now need uh, assistance as well, because they are not safe, uh, especially if they are not yet in uh, Western uh, European countries or North America, which they say uh, is their ultimate goal. They went to the countries where they were able to go without a Schengen visa or a, any other visa. Um, and we have been receiving requests from Russian journalists uh, and also from Ukrainian journalists who fled Ukraine or who remain in Ukraine. Uh, they're also in need of assistance, as I said. Uh, and this conflict has had a bigger impact on journalistic community. So we have been uh, helping Belarusian journalists, for example, who uh, fled uh, the crackdown uh, in their home country and relocated to Ukraine. Uh, some time ago, but then when the war started, they became double exiles of fleeing Ukraine and uh, seeking uh, refuge elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Goloza. That was a very uh, good overview. And you mentioned um, misinformation and uh, propaganda, which is a great uh, lineup for uh, Teresa Ribeiro, your, your organization, um, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has uh, written uh, much on these subjects even before this war in Ukraine. Could you talk a little bit about um, the use of uh, misinformation and disinformation and maybe begin by letting us know how you define those two terms and what, uh, from where you sit, you see is happening on the information and cyberspace. Sorry, I was taking my time just to unmute. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon, every everyone, and uh, a special greeting for Sergey, to with which I was uh, I met uh, last year in uh, in Kiev. Um, thank you very much for having me today. I think we are having a very, very important discussion uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, quite a lot of people have joined us and uh, we will have uh, uh, quite a good conversation. Um, yes, you rightly mentioned that uh, uh, we have been looking to disinformation, misinformation, um, and uh, of course now we are in a different stage uh, we are facing propaganda for war which is uh, something that is really different uh, but regarding this information of course for us this was uh, also very important to look at this information but from the angle of uh, uh, media freedom because in our region, and not only in our region, in, in the US region in general, and not only in one part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this region, unfortunately, many, many governments, many states are using misinformation, disinformation as a, a way to block and ban uh, websites, channels, in, uh, in, to re and restrict um, media freedom space. And this is a source of concern for us. And that's the reason why uh, we started last year, um, you know, a series of roundtables to look at uh, this information. You ask me, can you give me, if I can give you um, a, a definition of misinformation and disinformation. I think it's very difficult because, of course, we usually say, okay, this information, in the case of this information, there is a clear intent, there is a clear purpose uh, to uh, misuse uh, uh, this information, to cause some arms, uh, to have, uh, uh, to, to obtain some gains. Uh, but the problem is sometimes there, and in the case of, uh, of uh, misinformation, this uh, first intent is not there. But the problem is that uh, something that can start as disinformation, then it can be spread as misinformation. So I wouldn't say that it's very useful to try to define 
uh, these different notions, but maybe to look at them from the point of view of their effects. And their effects in both cases are, of course, uh, um, are of course not. Uh, uh, are, are, they 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 have a negative impact on uh, on media freedom and the freedom of expression. But I think also that the best way to address them uh, is not by restricting, but on the contrary, is through promoting um, is through promoting um, good journalism. Uh, is uh, investigative journalism, high professional standards. This is the best way. And to create real alternatives uh, for the information. And uh, I think this is the right approach to uh, misinformation and disinformation. But one thing that is completely different, it's propaganda for war. And this is what is happening uh, regarding uh, the Russian media. And in that case, here, uh, ICCPR, Article 20 of the ICCPR is very clear. It's not, it's, it's, it's mandatory to ban it. So it's not, you cannot choose, you should. Uh, it's not a question of can, but it's a question of should. So it's, uh, we are in a different level when we are talking about uh, propaganda for war. And I think it's important to distinguish these two phenomena, uh, uh, because if we start mixing everything, we are giving, an, uh, uh, we are giving uh, authoritarian governments a wonderful tool for restricting media freedom and freedom of expression. In the case, uh, in the case of Ukraine that we are talking now, of course, there was uh, really uh, a machinery of propaganda for war uh, that was really paving the way uh, and creating the right atmosphere for the acceptance of war. And there we are in another a level of, uh, of, uh, of discussion, I would say. But we need really to, uh, really to distinguish these two issues. I think uh, this is very, very important. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that later in the conversation. Yes. And I've already received some uh, viewer questions about that. But could you, within the context of journalism, could you talk about how you go about preventing, or as you use the word, should propaganda for war, does that mean that you are advocating active censorship? No, not at all. On the contrary, but in the case of Article 20, on the case of propaganda for war, it's really, we are, it's not any more information. So, and according to international law, according to international standards, yes, you should ban it. It's not allowed. It's, uh, uh, and I think we should be clear on it. But it's very interesting. You know, I was revisiting when preparing uh, our session, I was revisiting a little bit uh, some, uh, some resolutions of um, uh, early resolutions of uh, the UN General Assembly precisely on the interpretation of propaganda for war. And the interesting thing is that Propaganda for war, it's not only the promotion of war, but it's also uh, all the message that in a way um, pre want to prevent peace. In a way, isolate, of course, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you, it's not, um, it's, it's soft law, but in, in any case, it's important. It's coming from the General Assembly, uh, and so it's important. But it's very interesting. It's not only uh, to promote the war, but it's also to uh, 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 convey the message that, in a way, avoid peace. So, which is interesting, and uh, and uh, and also um, all the all the, the this the propaganda that really uh, tends to isolate 
uh, the, the people, uh, the citizens from, uh, from receiving information in, in this context of Article 20 is also considered to fall under this same Article 20. You see, it's not, it's what is against peace and it's also what promotes isolation of people from knowing the truth, which is very much what is going on now on Russia, where we have really a black hole uh, regarding information. Right, thank you. Um, um, we, we will come back to that, but I, I want to make sure yes. that we, we get to all the, uh, all, all, all the panelists. So um, I want to turn now to Anya. Anya, nice that you are working, uh, as I said at the beginning, with the uh, Clooney Foundation for Justice. And you bring a, a slightly different perspective from, uh, say, a journalist. Um, you are uh, looking at um, investigations into human rights abuses, um, not just here, but you're looking around the world. But here is, it's, it's very clear that journalists, particularly Ukrainian journalists, are on the front lines of what we are uh, seeing as, as maybe potential war crimes. That maybe puts them in a unique danger as witnesses. Could you talk a little bit about your, uh, what you're seeing in Ukraine in terms of the intersection of uh, basic journalism and reporting and what could be gross violations of, of, of international law? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with all of you. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think you're raising a very, very important uh, issue, Rob. And uh, I have to say, uh, for me, obviously, uh, the war in Ukraine is quite unique. Uh, it's unique both uh, in terms of the levels of violence. Indeed, uh, it's not to say that we haven't seen similar abuses uh, in other conflicts over the last decade, but the fact that over in the course of just two months, uh, we have seen reports of almost every uh, possible war crimes being committed from indiscriminate attacks with the use of cluster munitions and thermobaric weapons, attacks on health facilities, uh, killings, executions, uh, torture, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, the list goes on and on. But I think uh, at least uh, from where I stand and I have been working on uh, such issues for uh, many, many years, this conflict is also unique in another sense there has not been uh, another uh, situation where accountability efforts started as of day one, uh, both at the national level. This is not something we've seen you know, in Syria and Yemen and Ethiopia, unfortunately, but that's the case, uh, where the uh, Ukrainian prosecutor general opened an investigation, now has more than 7,000 criminal cases opened, uh, where the International Criminal Court opened the investigation almost, uh, I don't remember, it was the week one or two, second week um, of the conflict with the support of uh, several dozen countries, where we already have uh, more than a dozen countries who opened their own investigations under universal jurisdiction and other extraterritorial jurisdiction principles. Uh, and it is, uh, it is critically important because I do think that that is our best chance to bring justice to the victims, to the survivors, and also to bring the perpetrators to the account, because it is really probably the first time in decades where the evidence is being gathered while the bullets are still flying. Um, but it also means that uh, the efforts to collect these uh, evidence is being carried out by citizens by human rights organizations, but also by journalists who are all often the first ones, the first and closest witnesses of what is happening. And I'm not just uh, assuming this. I, uh, we obviously, we run, uh, you know, private criminal investigations, essentially, not even human rights investigations. And since the beginning of the conflict, I have been contacted by multiple journalists, both Ukrainian and foreign journalists who are on the ground in Ukraine asking what they can do to support the documentation efforts. Uh, 
And on one hand, this is incredibly important because as I said, you know, very often they are the first ones and closest to what is happening. But at the same time, it obviously puts additional burden on them. And it's the burden that they put on uh, themselves. But it also, as you said, makes them more vulnerable. Uh, it means that, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, you know they, they are often more exposed than uh, those working for the prosecutor's office to uh, the bullets from uh, Russian guns to being uh, detained and not having uh, the protection that some of the uh, law enforcement agencies must have, might have. Uh, they do not come there uh, weeks after, once the areas have been liberated. They're there on the ground uh, uh, as, as the conflict unrolls. So I do think, and what we have seen, uh, as Gulnoza explained, not all of the killings of journalists happened as retaliation for their professional activity, but some of them did. We know that journalists were arrested and killed execution style, essentially for their efforts to document. Uh, and I do think that that is uh, quite unique for this conflict. Not that we have never seen that before, but it is happening in Ukraine at large scale and it's happening as we speak. Sergei, is that uh, something that, um, that your members have experienced? Have any of them been targeted deliberately for doing the kinds of investigations that Anya is talking about? No, I can add that, uh, yep, we, we saw that um, for Russian journalists are um, targets and maybe <clears throat> the, the fact is that the largest number of short uh, media workers was in the suburbs of Kiev, near Bucha, near Irpin, and we think that uh, Russian occupiers, they understand that journalists... Uh, um, they uh, understood that journalists tried to fix uh, war crimes of Russians. So they, they, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and and maybe one of the foreign journalists correspondent from Switzerland, he was um, he was uh, stopped uh, by Russians. Uh, uh, he was wounded. But uh, he witnessed uh, that uh, Russian, when stopped him, they uh, ignore every rules, uh, every general status of him, and uh, his uh, car was uh, his had this his his car had big press sign. Uh, that he is civilian, he tried to be as on journalist, but uh, Russian occupiers they they beaten him, they they uh, received any money uh, from mm -hmm. him. So I think right. that yep, it's uh, official position of Russians uh, to target, to kill, to to pressure journalists on this war. Yeah, thank you. I, I think Rob, there is a sorry. Yes, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to go so back. Just, to just you, one, so one, go. one quick point. Um, I think uh, it is in some ways um, uh, the product of a very different era in which we live, because uh, it is uh, uh, you know there was a time when just exposure uh, was you know a sufficient deterrence. Uh, then we lived through the time when it was no longer the imperviousness of those in power became so ingrained that a story in the New York Times or uh, in a major national paper um, did not really make a difference. But now it is very different because it is not just a story. It is evidence that going straight into an already open criminal case. And so the stakes are much, much higher. And plus we have new, um, for example, digital forensic tools, which would allow to turn all of these videos and photographs into evidence that could determine where the strike came. And I think there is a certain level of understanding, including amongst uh, you know, at least some in the Russian command, that this is what's happening. That journalists, whether they're doing it intentionally or whether they're just doing their job, but they are collecting evidence that could be used in criminal cases again as the perpetrators. And of course, that, that makes a big difference. Indeed, I was, I was gonna ask you about the kind of forensic investigation that you're doing. I mean, journalists are civilians, but there are also civilians 
armed with cell phones who are out there and generating hours and hours of footage. Is that making your work any, any, any easier or are you still up against the same problems of, of verification that you would be in any other theater of war? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, it does, it makes it both easier and harder, of course. Uh, on one hand, you know, I uh, will never forget, you know, working in Chechnya, where there was no cell phones, no computers, no internet, and the only way to collect evidence, I mean, the, uh, you know, the no digital uh, uh, cameras. Yeah, so uh, literally every piece of video footage that came out um, was worth its weight in gold. And of course, but of course, very, very often it was impossible to attribute it. And that thus in the end, it was unusable. Now we're faced with a very different challenge. There are gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of information that is being sent and resent, um, shared amongst uh, different people, different organizations. And it's uh, a huge challenge of authentication and verification of every single um, video and photograph and image that comes from the conflict. So uh, fortunately, as I said, we do have tools to do that. Uh, the International Criminal Court has tools to do that, but it does take time and effort and skill. And that's partially why there are organizations to whom I am very grateful, such as Witness, for example, who are developing tools and trainings for those, for journalists and also for citizen document documenters on how to do it properly. Because it does matter how you take this video, how you take this photograph, uh, and it will determine whether it will be usable or not. Quite frankly, probably 90% of what is being collected now will not stand in court. It will still be an important record, but uh, the rest of it will be, and it will be, um, and we can increase the likelihood of a particular piece of information, be it an image or a testimony uh, or, or a video recording uh, to become part of the evidentiary base. Um, we do a lot with social media analysis. We do a lot with satellite imagery. There are really so many uh, different tools, but ultimately uh, none of them are usable without the traditional old school documentation, which is being on the ground, uh, which is observation, which is witness testimony, which is testimonies by survivors. Uh, all of these other tools make our work easier in some ways. Uh, they make the evidence stronger because they're harder to dismiss as compared to uh, somebody's testimony, uh, but they do require a completely different level of uh, technology and expertise to process them and verify them. So we in our work combine both uh, work on the ground, working with local partners, collecting information the same way we used to do it years ago, but also all of these uh, tools that are provided with the new technology for both collection uh, analysis and storage. Thank you. And I mean, what you're talking about something which meets a legal standard. And I think that one of the other things that, that, that is essential here is trust and trust in the media that we can verify the reports that we get. And I wanted to go back to you, Teresa Rivero, to talk a little bit. You talked about propaganda for war. Uh, one question that has come up in the chat, which I wanted to air here for the, the wider audience, is the banning or blocking of Russian media. Where do you stand on the blocking of outlets such as RT and Sputnik? You know, um, we don't monitor content here. We state uh, the principles, but it's not up to us as an organization to monitor uh, the content. So it's uh, up to the, uh, the organizations that take the decision uh, to be sure that they uh, are uh, in accordance and they are fully respecting uh, international human rights law. So it's not up to us. We state the principles and this for us is very uh, very, very important uh, in order to avoid uh, censorship and, uh, uh, and all uh, that really can uh, contribute uh, to shrink uh, the media freedom space. But I also would like to, to, um, to emphasize the importance of journalists in this war, the importance of accurate information uh, in this war, thanks to the brave 
work of the journalists on the ground. Uh, it's an unbelievable work. Not only, of course, and Daniel is absolutely right, they are doing an excellent work uh, for us to know what is, uh, uh, what is uh, really happening uh, on the ground. Imagine if they were not there, it would be impossible to really understand uh, what, uh, what is going on. So the media in, in this war is a, an important and key actor and uh, will def and with the <laughs> it's it's such a key and important role that uh, adds an immense impact for the future not only in the present for us to know what is happening in real time but also for the for the future to document all the human rights uh, gross violations so uh, I think this is very important. This is really important, and uh, uh, and it's it's quite unprecedented, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I as a as a journalist myself, who spent all my life covering uh, um, conflicts as well as politics, what strikes me here is an asymmetry in the information that we're getting. And I wanted to ask Olmoza if you could talk a little bit about what it is that is going on inside Russia that we're not hearing about. In, in, a, in, in a classic uh, uh, conflict, we would have expected to have some more information about how Russians are uh, prosecuting this war, morale, what is happening on that side. But there is, as I say, a, a, um, an asymmetry here in, in the information landscape. Could we talk a little bit about what it is that we're not getting from the Russian side and what effect that might be having on our understanding of what's going on in the, in the conflict generally? That's a very good question, Rob, thank you. Uh, yes, there is an asymmetry. There is uh, less and less information, independent information coming out of Russia simply because there are fewer, if any, independent journalists left. I would say that right now we're witnessing the death of uh, independent journalists in Russia because there are just very few uh, independent media outlets and journalists, including citizen journalists, uh, who are using uh, different platforms to distribute content, but those uh, avenues and platforms are shrinking day by day. Because as I said uh, earlier, the Russian authorities understand that they, this is the war over the truth, over information, and they want to uh, allow only their narrative, only their point of view uh, to reach their audiences. Uh, in the first place, it's the uh, domestic audiences, uh, Russians, and also uh, other audiences. Uh, and in some cases, they uh, are succeeding because we have seen that uh, societies, uh, even some families have been divided in their position about the war, not just inside Russia, but in Central Asia, for example, wh where there are a lot of uh, users uh, and consumers of Russian information and where Russian propaganda is uh, quite strong. Uh, it's very difficult to say how many Russians support the war in Putin because there are no independent surveys or polls conducted in Russia. That's why the work of journalists is very important. But as I said, because of new legislation, because of the Russian authorities blocking different websites, closing media outlets, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get any uh, independent uh, information. So at the beginning of the war, it was still possible to see who has what position on the war, but now it's much more difficult. And if uh, Putin stays in power, if the situation continues as it is, uh, if Russia is allowed to uh, keep control over at least some parts of uh, Ukraine in the future, uh, including Crimea, then the situation is uh, likely to continue. This blackout, uh, the information blackout in Russia is likely to continue. Thank you, Gormoza. Um, Anya, what, you're um, a, a longtime observer of Russia. You know, and you know about information um, and you know about propaganda. What do you think are the longer term uh, implications of um, 
this war for the work that um, journalists are doing and the work that you're doing in um, seeking uh, justice? Um, yeah, I would, um, I would second uh, Goldnoz's uh, uh, very grim assessment of the situation in Russia. Um, I'm not only a long-time observer, uh, the uh, Echo of Moscow, uh, the radio station that was just closed, uh, independent outlets, uh, was where I started uh, many, many years ago as a journalist myself, so it's very close to my heart, and uh, I do think that uh, I can share with you that uh, I'm pretty much spending my days watching, you know, horrendous uh, uh, image and speaking to people from places like Bucha. But what probably to me is even more horrifying is watching the um, opinion polls taken in the streets of different Russian towns, where I hear ordinary Russians, young and old, talking about their perception of the war and of the Russian or special operation, as they're supposed to call it. And that to me um, is terrifying. This level of, uh, or, or the, the success of the propaganda to me in Russia is terrifying. Um, I have been watching Russia for a long time. It did not start yesterday, but over the last couple of months, what we are witnessing is unprecedented and probably will affect generations to come unless we're able to change this narrative quickly. And that's why, just very quickly, I know we don't have a lot of time, one amongst the potential criminal cases that we are looking at as the organization are the charges again, as some of the Russian media outlets and some of the leading um, uh, propagandists uh, who are uh, allowed to appear in these media outlets. Uh, it will not be easy. There have not been many precedents in history, but we do have them. There was a case in Nuremberg. Uh, the, most, the more recent one is the case against uh, Rwandan radio. Uh, where the charges, uh, you know, there was a long list of charges, not all of them stood on appeal. And there were a few other cases. Uh, essentially, it's uh, kind of the criminal law reflection of what Teresa was explaining uh, from the human rights law perspective. There are charges of incitement to genocide. And interestingly for that, you do not have to establish that the genocide actually happened. Incitement to genocide is a separate charge under the Rome Statute. And uh, it is hard for me to say yet whether uh, the statements on Russian television and uh, media and, uh, and you know, agencies uh, amount to, uh, to this crime but it is definitely worth, worth investigating. So we do hope very much that at some point in time, the criminal court, international criminal court, will add these charges to its investigation uh, because what we are witnessing, the kind of statements that are allowed on Russian television and the kind of statements that are coming from the journalists themselves are to me an essential part of what is happening on the ground in Ukraine. And unless we're able to stop it, including through the means of criminal law, we will see it not only in this war, but in other conflicts to come. Thank you, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, we're coming towards the end of, of our time, so I wanna make sure that I give everyone um, an opportunity to, uh, to wrap and, and, and make some uh, closing remarks. Um, if I could get back to you, um, Sergei, um, if you wanted to respond to what Anya said, or is there anything that uh, we haven't covered that you would like to, to add to this discussion? Well, uh, maybe I want to add to Anya that, uh, yep, we, Ukrainian journalists, we agree that um, if the majority of Russian journalists and media workers from Moscow to the prov provin provincial cities were against the incitement of hatred, so I think that the war would not uh, have started. 
So um, I think that first was uh, this uh, big Russian propaganda, and the second uh, were Russian tanks. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's the real of this war. But um, but uh, at the same time, I think that the mission of journalists, of Ukrainian foreign journalists, now is to fight injustice. So that is why hundreds of brave journalists now are challenging this evil Putin and his empire. But journalists are important. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, can I go to you, uh, Teresa Rivera? Would you like to, uh, to add anything to the discussion, maybe on the points, again, that Anya made, that it was the words first and the tank second? My, just... Uh... Uh, allow me just uh, some publicity, which, uh, because yesterday, uh, and I will explain why I think it's important, uh, all the four uh, freedom of expression mandate holders, which means uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, UN, uh, Irene Khan, uh, OAS, uh, and uh, as well as, uh, as uh, the African Commission, they adopted a joint statement on this war. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really an achievement because to have a joint statement um, with such a global reach um, is, uh, is important and really mark this, uh, this, um, uh, this, this uh, World Press Freedom Day uh, this year. So I think it's important. It, it was uh, uh, an important step because all the mandate holders uh, uh, of freedom of expression mandate holders, they were clear regarding uh, the condemnation of the war and uh, uh, what is going on, um, namely in Russia. So my final words would be for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And Anya, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, my final word would also be just to commend uh, Ukrainian journalists uh, uh, through Sergei, who is present here, and also the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, uh, you know, for all your work that you've been doing all of these years, uh, both in terms of documentation and support for journalists like Sergei and his colleagues in conflicts around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. And finally, Golnoza, to you. If we want to, if we want the truth to prevail in this fight, we need to make sure that uh, all territories of Ukraine are liberated from Russia. That's as simple as that. Because we've seen that in Crimea and Donbas, Russia killed all independent media, jailed journalists. There are journalists serving prison sentences in Crimea as we speak now. And if we don't want uh, media to continue to be a hostage of the Putin regime, we, uh, you know, the world needs to support free Ukraine. Thank you. And with that, I think I would like to um, thank uh, all four of you for taking part in this uh, very uh, rich and interesting discussion. And on this World Press Freedom Day, I would also like to thank all those journalists, particularly uh, your colleagues, Sergei, and others who are on the ground in uh, Ukraine, and those who are trying to bring us the truth from or about Russia. Their work is vitally important, and this is the day that we salute them and all who support them. Thank you, uh, Teresa Rivero, Anya Neistat, um, Sergei Tomlienko, and uh, Gonoza Said. Thank you so much, and uh, thank, uh, thank you also to our audience. Goodbye.